everyone, today I'm going to be doing a different sort of video. Over the past few weeks, I've been able to get a little bit ahead on my video making schedule. One of the benefits of doing a channel that deals primarily with history is that I can make a video now that won't be uploaded for weeks. So since I have a little bit of extra time, I'm going to experiment with a vlog series. These videos won't interfere with the normal tri-weekly videos that I upload every third Thursday. So let me know what you think. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below with any topics that you want me to discuss in the future. Since these videos will be pretty casual, I'll just read the comments for topic suggestions. This first video of the vlog series is going to be a top 10 list of my favorite ocean liners. I'm sure this isn't necessary for my audience, but it seems like standard procedure for this sort of top 10 video. This is a subjective video. That's right. This video is my opinion of the top 10 ocean liners. With that said, I would welcome you to leave a list of your top 5 or top 10 favorite ocean liners in the comment section below. I would encourage it even. Okay, let's get started. Number 10, Leviathan. I have mixed opinions about Albert Baldwin's trio of superliners and the story of their creation. While Germany's efforts to outdo British shipbuilding are interesting, it takes away from the character of their ships when certain design elements stem directly from this vanity rather than from actual needs. Imperator was a flawed ship in many ways, but the kinks were worked out with Vaterland and Bismarck. Once the eagle figurehead was gone, the forecastle changed, and the instability eliminated, this class of ships was greatly improved. I can even appreciate the ornamental scroll work at the bow, which brought a more subtle flair to the aesthetic. Clearly, Imperator was not my favorite, so that leaves Vaterland and Bismarck. I'm going with Vaterland, later known as Leviathan, because she was the first major liner flying the American ensign, and I like the tasteful red, white, and blue funnels. Number 9. Atlantic. In the past few years I've developed an appreciation for the transitional auxiliary liners, so I had to include at least one on this list, and the Oceanic class is certainly my favorite class of auxiliary liners. But I have to pick just one from this class for this video, so I will choose the Atlantic for no other reason than the fascinating story of her loss near Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1873. Learning about the Atlantic really brings you back to a time when maritime technology was still fairly primitive, and crossing the ocean on a ship like the Atlantic was a far cry from what one would expect just a decade or two later. The ship was powered by a single screw propeller, but relied on her full rig of sails for speed and safety in the event of a problem with her engines. There were some amenities on board for the comfort of passengers, but you won't forget for a second that you were on board a ship, it being lit with oil lamps and such. I would say that I wish to go back and sail on a ship like the Atlantic, but that might be a little insensitive to the people who died in the tragedy and the people on other 19th century liners who had to endure the discomforts and risks of being at sea. Number 8. Queen Elizabeth II. This was a tough one. It took me a while to decide between QE2 and SS French for this spot. I even considered Queen Mary II for a few minutes until I really thought about it. QE2, as she is affectionately called, was the last major ocean liner built before Queen Mary II in 2004. Even though she was completed after the SS France, QE2 ended up as the last ocean liner making regular scheduled crossings across the Atlantic, and she carried the tradition of transatlantic crossings into the 21st century. Without her, who is to say whether or not we would even have Queen Mary II, or if there would be any ocean liners left crossing the Atlantic today? RMS Queen Elizabeth II is a beautiful modern liner on the outside. I'm not in love with the style of her interiors, but the 70s aren't exactly known for having aged well, and the furnishings can always be changed, so I can overlook this. Number 7. Avernia. I have a soft spot for single funnel liners. There's something satisfyingly utilitarian about them, but because they do tend to be utilitarian, they often aren't all that attractive by traditional standards. But Cunard's Avernia was one of the few exceptions to this rule. She had nice, clean lines and a very sleek profile. Unfortunately, I don't know much about Avernia's layout or interiors, so this pick is based entirely on the exterior aesthetics. If anyone does have any pictures or photographs of the interior of Avernia, please consider sharing them. Number 6. Aquitania. Ah, the ship beautiful. When I was younger, I often wondered why people called her this. From my perspective, she wasn't particularly beautiful. But then I realized how Aquitania actually earned her name. Her interiors. The rooms of Cunard's last four stacker were bright, finely detailed, and uniquely pleasant. Aquitania was Cunard's answer to White Star's Olympic class ships, and she arguably lived up to the goal of surpassing White Star's leading class of ships. Although not as fast as her predecessors, she was still an express liner with a service speed of 23 knots, compared with Olympic's 21 knots. And she was about the same size at 45,600 gross registered tons. And her interiors were more ambitious to say the least. 
Now, before people get too upset by this, let me just say that I personally prefer the interiors of the Olympic class, but I cannot deny that I understand why many people would prefer those of Aquitania. Finally, Aquitania's career was remarkable for her passengers, her owners, and even the Royal Navy. Number 5. Lusitania It could be argued that Lusitania was the first superliner, because she was the first ship to surpass 30,000 gross vitres or tons, and the first ship to surpass 20,000 gross vitres or tons, while having a 20 knot service speed. But the term superliner is subjective and vague. What can't be argued is that Lusitania was a revolutionary ship the first large ship to be powered exclusively by turbine engines. She crossed the Atlantic at 25 knots, and held the blue ribbon until her nearest sister, Mauritania, captured it by a slim margin. In fact, it was hard for me to choose between Lusitania and Mauritania for the spot. There are some things I like better about Mauritania, but Lusitania's interiors were more unique, her profile a little bit cleaner, and frankly, I prefer her name. Is that a bad reason to choose Lusitania? Maybe. But hey, it's my list. Number 4. Georgic. There's something iconic about Cunard White Star's two motor ships, Britannic and Georgic. They weren't particularly big, although they were large for diesel powered ships at the time. They weren't particularly fast either, with a service speed of about 18 knots. In fact, by this time, 18 knots would probably be considered fairly slow for ships of their size. But Britannic and Georgic were unique. They were a perfect blend of modernity and tradition. Having traditional lines and a knife edge bow, but a cruiser stern and two squat funnels. But what gave Georgic the edge over her sister Britannic, in my opinion, are her Art Deco interiors. From the perspective of an untrained person in 2020, Art Deco is a stylish blend of modern flair and traditional taste, just like the Georgic's exterior appearance. Number 3. Normandy Speaking of Art Deco, the SS Normandy is often considered to be the pinnacle of ocean liner history. In 1934, the largest ship in the world was White Star's Majestic at 56,000 gross registered tons. The next year, Normandy was launched, and suddenly the largest ship in the world was 80,000 gross registered tons. In other words, a 50% jump overnight. But this gigantic leap in ship size is not all that makes Normandy spectacular. She was ahead of her time in so many ways, and I cannot possibly discuss all of them in the context of this video, and it would be overwhelming to even try. But Normandy was the embodiment of Art Deco, and that is a great look for an ocean liner. I mean, just look at this ship. Also, Normandy held the blue ribbon for a while, and only two ships in history have surpassed her crossing times. Number 2. Oceanic Like Normandy and Aquitania, Oceanic was by definition a unique ship, having no sisters to speak of. And although Normandy might have been the pinnacle of the ocean liner era overall, Oceanic, I would argue, was the pinnacle of ocean liners of the 20th century, and that does make sense given that she was launched in 1899. I won't say too much here, but rather refer you to my video about Oceanic, which goes much more in depth than I can in this video. But I will say that she is exactly what I would want if I were to cross the Atlantic on an ocean liner today. Comfortable, with amenities such as sufficient bathrooms, excellent food, and plenty of space while not being so advanced as to make me forget that I am on a ship in the middle of the ocean. And no, I don't think her funnels are too tall. Okay, we've made it to my number one pick. This one will likely earn me a lot of flack from those in the ocean liner community. But I've thought a lot about it, and I'm not going to lie about my favorite ocean liner. It's Titanic. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. What a boring choice. So unoriginal. Maybe, maybe. But I have thought about this one. The Olympic-class ships were undoubtedly beautiful from the outside. Beautiful lines, very clean and simple. Traditional features, sleek and yacht-like. On the inside, they were traditional in a lot of ways, and definitely traditional in terms of White Star Line ships. But I like that. I like that the first class dining room wasn't multiple decks high, I like that everything was decorated with finished wood, and I like that everything looked comfortable rather than over the top. Now, I was a little torn as to which Olympic class ship I would choose as my number one, but I genuinely believe that Titanic was the best of the three even though Britannic was probably best from a technical, objective standpoint. And I almost did go with Britannic, because there are a few features on Britannic that I like better, such as the enclosed after well deck. But there are also some features I don't like at all, such as the modified grand staircase area at the bow deck level. Honestly, this alone is enough to give Titanic the edge over Britannic in my mind, since the first class entrance on the bow deck is probably my favorite spot on Titanic. As for why I didn't choose Olympic, well, there are a few, admittedly nitpicky, aesthetic features that I don't prefer, such as the open promenade deck, the lack of overhang on the bridge, 
and the missing private promenades for the two parlor suites on P-Deck. To be clear, I'm not choosing Titanic because of her story. It is true that I wouldn't know the ship if it wasn't for her sinking, but it's unlikely that I would know any ocean liner except for Lusitania if Titanic hadn't sunk. But even if Titanic hadn't sunk, she would still be as noteworthy as Aquitania, Queen Mary, or Leviathan, and Titanic is my favorite of the bunch. Okay, so that's my list. You might have noticed a few things about the ships on this list. First, most of the ships here were not champions of speed. Many of them are express liners, but only two of them held the blue ribbon at any point. I think speed is definitely important for an ocean liner, but only up to a certain point. Shaving an hour or two off a crossing is not a priority for me when you're talking about a five-day voyage, especially if that comes at the expense of, well, expense, and of onboard comforts. Another thing, all but two of these ships have knife-edge bows. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something about the sharp, vertical stem of the ship that I really like. Okay, I'll wrap this one up here. Again, I want to know what you think about this list, and I want to know what your favorite liner is too, so make sure you leave a comment below. And thank you for checking out this experimental video. I'll definitely be posting more in the future, but the frequency of the vlog series will depend on the feedback I get from you guys, and frankly the amount of time I have. Again, it won't interrupt the regular tri-weekly video series. Mm -hmm.